For those that are living abroad and considering investing in Jamaica into real estate specifically, one, do you have to be Jamaican? Two, can you do that from abroad? Three, walk us through the detailed process of how that goes. Anybody doing business in Jamaica has to possess a TRM. If you're doing a mortgage, it has to be a bank in Jamaica. The first thing the bank is going to ask you for the surveyor's ID report. Bank will also require a valuation. Also, your attorney that represents you has to be licensed to practice real estate in Jamaica. In Jamaica, legal fees are a percentage of the cost of the property that you're purchasing. So you will need also to pay for the sales agreement. The transfer fee, which is 2% registration fee stamp duty once you have gone through that process congratulations you now are a proud owner of real estate in paradise hello thrive family and welcome back to another video podcast episode if this is your first time visiting a special welcome to you my name is winthrop wellington and i am the host of on deck with throp where we have meaningful conversations all about jamaica with people from all over the world and today we have a very special guest a friend that i've actually been building a both personal and professional relationship over the last few months actually for the majority of this year and he is a real expert and not only real estate in the grill but real estate all over jamaica and it is my pleasure and honor to welcome my friend saint alban clark to the podcast thank you very much throp i must say i'm really honored to be here today i like what you do i've been watching what you've been what you've been doing online and it's a real honor to be sharing the stage with you, reaching your audience, which I know. Listen to what you say. They understand that you know what you're talking about. And just presenting to them today makes me feel very honored. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. And it's nice to have you on the show finally. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, we've been talking a lot about real estate over the last few months where Jamaica real estate has been where it is now and where it's going. But before we get into all that, I think it's very important for the audience and also myself to understand a little about, bit more about St. Alban. So where are you from originally? Well, I'm, in the true sense of the word, I'm an island boy. Okay. You know, born and bred in Jamaica, been all over the world, but still Jamaica is my spot. Where in Jamaica? All right, so I was born in Lucy. Oh, okay. Which okay. is next door to where we are right now. We're actually in Westmoreland, Negril. Um, I was born in Lucy. Um, I went to school in Lucy. I'm now living in, in Montego Bay. So um, I've never been too far from sea, sand, and sun. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. And what made you get into real estate? Uh, well, you know what? I think it's something that... Now that I'm looking back at my journey, I think it's something that was just predestined um, because real estate, for all intents and purposes, is a relationship business. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. You know, I'm a middleman. You know, I'm a broker of deals. And one of my skills is, I think, pairing the right property with the right owner, right? And I have... A specific processes that I go through to make that happen. You know, for example, um, I've kind of positioned myself as a, a global realtor, right? Most of my client base fall outside of Jamaica. I see. And presenting myself as a knowledgeable and trusted realtor is key to how I perform. And what I offer to my clients makes it work for me because... For anybody who has ever done real estate in Jamaica, if this is your first rodeo, if that was your first rodeo, depending on who was guiding the process, you might not have such a heartwarming story because it can be very, very precarious, for want of a better word. Um, the, the, the process of transferring real estate, which is conveyancing, it's not as simple as in other locales like in the U.S. and Canada where in some um, municipalities you might be able to close on a property in a week, two weeks, 30 days, 
you know, in Jamaica be, because of every all the entities, government entities specifically that are involved in the process. Uh, it, 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 it takes a considerable mm -hmm. longer time than that, especially if there's a mortgage that's involved, you know, because you first have to start with getting pre-approvals for your mortgage, um, finding the right realtor. First of all, finding a responsive mortgage um, loan officer, which can be not as easy as, it's, as it sounds. Um, finding the realtor, finding the property, then um, finding an attorney, finding like um, the tradesmen that are involved in the process, like the surveyor, the valuation. Imagine doing that outside of Jamaica. You know? So I, I want to get into like mm. the nitty gritty details right. of this and really get in the weeds of that. But before we do, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been? A, a little reader? under 10 years. A little um, under 10 years. Right. And you said you were abroad for a while? No, no, no. So, all right. So my journey um, touched on a number of different industries. But the commonality is that they always required me having a skill in dealing with people. So, for example, I did 13 years in the airline industry. Got it. Now, that's a university unto itself. Because on any given day, you're meeting multiple um, personality types, right? And for persons who travel over the world, you will understand that traveling in itself can be a very stressful, very stressful experience. I mean, delays, cancellations, security lines, and whatever. So working at the airport, you are in a position where you are almost always trying to diffuse tension, diffuse situations, making it right. I also did um, a stint in the, the quick ser food service industry, quick service industry, which also um, presented its range of challenges. But what I took from that are the learning experience that I know poor wholeheartedly into my real estate career. And what it does, it helps me to find solutions. I'm a very solution-oriented person. So yes, um, and I have in my airline career, which as I said, spanned 13 years, it gave me the unique opportunity, or maybe not so unique, but a blessed opportunity to travel to different areas of the world, um, understanding what drives behavior. You know, understanding even from a real estate perspective, even though I didn't know it then, but how people live, what do they look for, you know, what motivates them to travel. I mean, Jamaica is a big travel destination, and we understand that, I mean, with the world having uh, about 6 billion people right now, just the fact that people have so much places to go, and Jamaica continues to be a destination that people are attracted to, it means that we have something here. So I think when I looked at that and just, I must admit, the appeal of the real estate lifestyle on the big screen, it is very appealing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is not as the glitz and glamour that is portrayed. However, there are many, many, many benefits and many, many very rewarding moments that, I mean, I could write a book All right, right I'm now. sure, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And with that and being in the real estate industry for the past decade, and you're with Remax With now, Remax, right. And what differences have you seen or changes have you seen in the last decade compared to when you started in this industry and where we are now, specifically here in Jamaica? All right, so I would say... Demand, real estate is always a good option, always. Demand increases, sometimes it decreases, sometimes it lays flat. But it's always a good place to be. Um, over the last 10 years, many things have happened, but I would prefer to focus on the last 36 months, mm -hmm. right? which has been um, a, a dizzying change has occurred in real estate. And this, I think, has impacted the industry globally. It's not something that's concentrated on a small pocket. You know, anywhere you are in the world right now, um, property values in the last 36 months have gone up exponentially. You know, 
to, to, the, to the point where I'm watching the news sometimes and people in North America are in a sense of despair. They have their money and they can't find anywhere to buy that they can afford. Something that was $200,000 in 2019 is now 500000 So it has been a really, really phenomenal move. And what that has done, it has, it has um, lapped up a lot of the liquidity in the market. So demand has now become what's driving more um, escalations in price because people want real estate to buy. And that's also specific to Jamaica. It is definitely specific to Jamaica. Um, prices have, in some cases, doubled, you know, or appreciated by at least, let's say, a property in a typical area like Bogue Village in Montego Bay, uh, which is a middle-income residential community. Um, it's about 20 years old. And in 2019, a two-bedroom, one-bathroom starter home was going for like about 12 million in 2019. Today, in 2022, which is just a three year span, um, that same house is commanding 19 and 20 million dollars. And you know? what do you think is, is driving, I know you hinted at this before, but what is driving that price so high, specifically, especially in that market, in that Montego Bay market? All right, what, what, what my data has, has um, alluded to, there has been a shift in general global thinking, right? Um, and as I was mentioning to you before we started this, con this um, session, I am realizing now, like for example, in North America and Caribbean, working from home is not a novel idea. It's not new. It's, it's been around for a while. But what I think um, the global pandemic has done, it has put, in, put um, a more... People are, are stretching that concept, trying to find the limit, and there might not be any limit to working from home. Meaning, if you live in D.C. and your job is in the city, right, and you used to have to, to fight traffic to get to work every day, and you get the option to work from home, you might just be thinking about working from the address that you live at, right? No. What people are doing is realizing more and more that working from home is not confined to where you take your meals. You know, you can, people are now renting a furnished apartment, for example, in Montego Bay, let's say for $1,000 per month, US. which is 1000 US, mm -hmm. which depending on where in the US they are from, that might be a steal, right? It might be a very good deal. And... They are, they are renting that on a long-term lease, a 12-month lease, right? And they're only there like every other month or total of four months out of the year, five months. But they're still happy to pay for it every month because they have somewhere to stay when they come to Jamaica and they can, they can work as they, they are working. I mean, if they're doing a job where they're working from nine to five, guess what? At a minute past five, they're on the beach, you know? So it, it, it's a nice little hybrid of being in the real world, locked up in your little office in Jamaica, and then as soon as you're done with that, you, your vacation starts. And you do that for a month, two months. Go back to the U.S. or whatever and come back. And what some people also do in that same scenario that same spot that they are paying $1,000 for, they might see the opportunity to, hey, I'm only using this for four months. Why don't I try to make some money off it? Mm -hmm. No, the problem with that is that some, um, the owners might not readily agree to that. And, and I can tell you this in real life. I had this same scenario where one of my clients, her name is Jennifer, she was doing that. She was paying $1,000. And I said to her, hey, why don't you buy somewhere in Jamaica? She was like, can I buy in Jamaica? Because, I mean, she's not Jamaican. Mm -hmm. I said, of course, these are your requirements. And as a global realtor, I, I position myself to give you those resources. You know, I work with all the, the major banks in Jamaica mm -hmm. to assist you 
pointing you in the right direction to get a mortgage, you know, walking you through the process. Um, I work with um, the real estate attorneys as well. I can refer you to reliable, um, efficient, speedy um, lawyers that you don't have to be worried about what's going on with your deal. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. She got her mortgage. Uh, She's paying just a little bit more than what she was paying for rent. Um, for a mortgage, but now she's using that same apartment as also an Airbnb when she's not occupying it herself. So, can you share with us how much she paid for that house she, and yeah, the details? Yeah, she paid um, for that one bedroom. She paid two two hundred and twenty thousand dollars U.S. U.S. And she's paying her mortgage is a little over a thousand. A little over a thousand. Yeah. Okay, that's a good deal. Right. Exactly. And she can make that money back through Airbnb to or Airbnb or whatever if she so desires. Okay. Right. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. are you seeing a lot of people do that in in terms of your clientele? Oh yeah, I am. And just to continue answering the question that you had asked, you know, what's responsible for this upsurge? Again, it's demand. Mm-hmm. It goes down to demand. And people are now recognizing that I can buy in Jamaica. You know, I can ho- own a piece of paradise. I mean, Jamaica was primarily marketed as a, a, a short-stay destination, Negril in particular. You know, and persons are now realizing that, hey, I can own something here. I mean, yes, the all-inclusives are nice, but once you come to Jamaica with a certain amount of frequency, you want to be a part of the landscape. You want to be a part of the culture. You want to know that you can tell your friends, hey, I've got a spot in Jamaica if you're going down. And you, 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 especially in Negril, you are in a position to experience the authentic Jamaica. Because you and I will agree that the type of tourism, the type of environment that Negril creates, Negril is not just a location, it's a state of mind. You know, it is a it is a vibe. You know, when you are a tourist in Negril, you get more out of your vacation by being a part of the the the, the landscape. What's going on? You're having a drink at the at the local bar. You're eating at the local restaurants, and you understand. Hey, this is Jamaica. This is the energy that I really wanted. So I think that awareness, and also the pent up demand that was created by the global pandemic. People are taking a different approach to life. You know, people understand the, the, um, the fleeting nature of us being around and wanting to, to get as much out of it. You know, so people are taking out a lot of the money that they had stored away and say, listen, I want to enjoy some life. And Jamaica, I think, has positioned itself as a destination of choice where people want to be. I mean, the lifestyle, our energy, our music, our food, um, our creativity, on a large scale, it is no. it has always been appealing, but I think it's now translating into people wanting to own a piece of it. And it, I mean, Jamaicans living overseas have seen where the demand from that subsector has tripled. You know, Jamaicans living overseas now I'm more interested in, hey, listen, I need to invest back in Jamaica. So, you know, it's a win-win situation. But what it does, it contributes to the demand that is out there, and it drives up the prices as well. So why would somebody, from an investment standpoint, why mm-hmm. would somebody invest in Jamaica as opposed to another island nation or maybe wherever they're from? Uh, again, it depends on what the investor is looking for. There are many, many different types of investments in Jamaica. But let me just touch on one that has, is, a, is a big contributor to Jamaica's economic picture, which is like the BPOs, the business process outsourcing or the call centers, as we call it. Um, and that's, that's a huge chunk of the real estate market as well. You know, they, these operators take up Large spaces, they demand typically anywhere between 10,000, 30 to 30, 40,000 square feet of, of space, usable space. Now, what they find about Jamaica as opposed to other Caribbean countries, now, why they're attracted to Caribbean countries is, of course, tax write-offs and the, the money they save on paying salaries, right? However, what puts Jamaica, in my opinion, as... Um, 
on top of where they want to be is our young people i think um they 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 they, they seem to grasp things very quickly also the language barrier is not as evident as let's say um a country that english is not their first language you know so a lot of business processing outsource companies might go to mexico or you know other spanish speaking countries but they find out that their clients because business process outsourcing really the operator of that business they want their clients to feel comfortable when they're speaking with a rep you know they want to almost feel like they can drive down the road and go and go to the office you know if they need something in office so just the way how jamaicans grasp that language barrier it makes um those customers feel as if this is someone who relates so to what they're going through sorry so are you saying that because the bpo industry is so strong and prominent in jamaica that is a driving factor of the economy therefore in turn pushes uh, other industries up we exactly exactly and that's one, one of them, yeah. and that's one subsector of investors that are attracted to jamaica mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. i see i see so and and the reason in the context of that question is that i'm thinking of as you mentioned a demographic before mm-hmm. jamaicans who were born here and maybe have gone and are living their professional lives in the United States and are thinking about coming back and thinking about investing in Jamaica, maybe retiring here. And I'm sure through their experience, I would consider them to be savvy investors. And maybe perhaps more than likely, this is probably not their first real estate deal. Right. right. And so they're trying to compare and contrast that where they want to spend their golden years or maybe they're in the middle of their career and right. they want to get out of the US and it's like man should I go to Jamaica or should right. I go to Costa Rica and I and like the reason that makes me ask this question is my father's cousin he actually wanted he wanted to retire here but he chose to go to Costa Rica and said right. I don't really know specifically the reasons mm-hmm. but I'm saying that to say is, is like Jamaica is not the only option right. for the diaspora. Right. And I think just bringing understanding, not necessarily selling people on it, but right. just like showing like, you know, these are the advantages of right. being here. And you clearly outlaid right. laid some of them as well. And getting into the specific applicability of purchasing real estate, and specifically right the diaspora that you're talking about and purchasing real estate from abroad. Can you help us understand a little bit the process of making that happen? Because that's a question that comes up a lot on my channel and in the comments. One, do I have to be Jamaican to own real estate? Two, if I'm living in New York or Toronto or in England, can I can I purchase land? Can I invest in, in new development? And could you answer some of those questions and then also walk us through what that process would be like for those people? And that's actually a very good question, Throp, because that is where it all begins. So in order for you to increase your chances as, of having a good transaction, you have to start right, you know? And starting right... I think, begins with finding the right realtor, you know? Someone who has that experience, someone who has the connections, and someone who has the experience with dealing with a global market, right? So, um, just to dispel one or two of the misconceptions that are out there, because what I realize, just speaking with some of my my satisfied customers, um, when they're looking at the Caribbean, they sometimes don't specify Jamaica in getting their information, right? Because they might not, they might be shortlisting a number of possible destinations that they want to invest. So they might be mistaken because some of the Caribbean countries, they actually have restrictions on who can buy real estate, right? Now, just so your audience knows, Jamaica is not one of those countries, all right? So as long as you are qualified financially um, to make an investment, 
then you're already on the way to becoming a property owner in Jamaica. So anybody and can own property in Jamaica, anybody, any global citizen. Right. So what you need to do, this very important thing, is what's called a, t- it's a TRN, which means a taxpayer registration number. So anybody doing business in Jamaica has to possess a TRN. And, and you don't have to be a national of Jamaica. You don't have to even have ever visited Jamaica because the facilities are there online for you to do that process. You can actually apply for it online or you can get your attorney, you know, which is another, another important component of the whole process to get a competent real estate attorney to make sure that your best interests are protected. You real know? estate attorney here in Jamaica. Here in Jamaica. Got they it. have to be licensed to practice in Jamaica. Now, as your realtor, you know, part of my process is to find out first how do you plan to finance this purchase, right? Are you going to be using your own money, which would make it a cash purchase? Now, a cash purchase obviously gives you um, more muscle, right? It puts you in a better position to negotiate. So you're in a position of advantage when you do a cash purchase. And just to speak a little bit more about about that before I continue, um, for anybody in North America, let me just talk about North America. I know USA, Canada, and to a certain extent, the UK. Um, I'm, I'm going to put the UK into that group as well. If you own the property longer than three years in any one of those countries that I just described, there's a pretty good chance that your property would have gained a a substantial amount of equity during the last 36 months. That could also give you an option of taking some of that equity out of that property that you now own and using that money to invest in Jamaica. So what that also now that becomes cash. It puts you in a position now in Jamaica where you can now say, proudly say, hey, I'm a cash purchaser, right? Now, if you decide to go the mortgage route, that's also a very, I mean, viable option. It does take a little more jumping through hoops, right? And again, dealing with the current mortgage officer is paramount to your success, right? Okay, so I just want to be clear on the Mm. mortgage. So, again, being a global citizen that's wanting to invest in real estate in Jamaica, Mm -hmm. get your TRN, and you're not a cash buyer, but you want to get financing through the Jamaican Financial Institute. That's right. That's possible. That's right, right. So, let me just note this, and this is something... I've had to also clarify with a lot of overseas investors who want to buy in Jamaica and want to do a mortgage. Please understand that if you're doing a mortgage in Jamaica, the mortgage has to come from a Jamaican bank for obvious reasons. Your bank, your bank in Atlanta will not lend you money for a property that they can't see. Right? So if the property is in Jamaica and you're actually, because when you do a mortgage, remember the bank owns the property and you are paying for it in installments until you own it. So the bank has no way, the US based bank has no way to verify the authenticity of that purchase. Right? So if you're doing a mortgage, it has to be a bank in Jamaica. Right? Also, your attorney that represents you has to be licensed to practice real estate law in Jamaica, right? So, you know, just make a note of that because I've had multiple clients who thought they could get a mortgage from their bank. I mean, they have a good relationship with their bank back in the U.S., but no, it has to be in Jamaica. And typically, the banks in Jamaica require, you know, all the same fun stuff that you would present to your bank in the, in the U.S. or otherwise, they're going to need to see your tax returns, right? They're going to need to see your proof of income. They're going to need to see your um, other financial components of your life in order to make that decision as to say, hey, you, based upon what you present to us, we can lend you a maximum of 
whatever. So that's the first thing. And any realtor that you are working with, um, as long as they are on top of their game, that's the first thing that they want to know. You know, have you are you pre-approved, or can you can can you present proof that you have this money to make this purchase? And uh, mm-hmm. you, as the realtor, will you help the client find lending Cert- institutions? Certainly. Basically, I I I hand I hold my client's hands through the entire process because he, here's why. The main reason is a real estate um, acquisition is not something that you do. The typical person doesn't do a whole bunch of that, right? You might have one real estate purchase for your entire life. If you're lucky, two or three, right? So there is really no need for you to become an expert in the process, right? Because it might not be something that you'd ever use again. Mm -hmm. So once you find someone who is able to guide you, make sure you don't make any missteps, right? Then that's what you want, right? So you start with um, getting the right mortgage. And what I typically do for my clients is that I give them options. As I said earlier, I work with all of the major banks in Jamaica. I send them referrals. And why, if you come to me wanting a referral to, for a mortgage, I refer you to three banks, right? Because now, different banks have slight variations of their packages. Say, for example, Jamaica National might be offering um, a discount to new new mortgages, new mortgages, or they might be offering a discount to mortgages originating outside of Jamaica, right? It might be something that could be running for maybe a month or so. As the realtor, I might not know all of these promotions that the different banks are, are, are offering, but once, you, once I refer my client to the bank, then the conversation becomes personal, you know, between the banks. So they are now able to look at what each bank's bank is offering. You might have a bank that's offering a discount on their rates for a limited period, and this might just be the time for you to jump on it. Or some banks will give you a preferential rate if you're a Jamaican, you know, or they will give you a better loan-to-value ratio, you know, if you're a Jamaican living overseas. You know, let's say, for example, their normal loan-to-value ratio for um, a non-Jamaican would be, okay, we'll give you a maximum of 80% of the value of the property. You will have to find 20. But if you are a Jamaican or your spouse is a Jamaican, they might up that to giving you 90%. So you only have to come up with 10%. So those are the little the little um, accessories, that the little add-ons that when I refer you to three banks, you look at everything that each one is gotcha. offering. Also the interest rate, you know? And then you decide which one you go forward with. Because they're basically asking you for the same set of paperwork. And you know? are there large variations in the interest rates between the banks? Not typically. Not typically. Okay. You might have a 0.5 percentage or whatever. But, but yeah. So you're really, as a potential investor, you're really looking for those nuanced differences right. between exactly. the institutions. That's right. And that's, that's what kind of... Pushes you over. That's the exactly. And correct. can you give us an idea about those interest rates or about where they are right now? Well, you know what? I prefer not to speak about interest rates right mm-hmm. now because as we speak, there are adjustments being made. You know, um, worldwide interest rates are going up, you know, but each bank will have their little buffers that they, mm-hmm. they send. Um, it's typically in the range of about 6.9, 7.5 for the commercial banks. However, there are situations in Jamaica where I can actually point you in a direction where you get as low as 0% mm-hmm. interest rate. That's for another podcast. Okay, <laughs> all right. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. And these are U.S. dollar loans? Um, depends on what you bring to the table. Yes, it okay. could be U.S. or Jamaican. And those mm-hmm. rates would be the same for both currencies? No. Okay. No, 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 no. So typically a U.S. dollar loan um the interest rate is lower okay right mm. so would that be in that original range that you gave us between 
the the six percent. No, no, no. That would be um, Jamaica dollar. Okay. Jamaica. And so the you can expect the U.S. loan percentage interest rate to be lower than six percent. Yes. Okay. A little lower, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I reason why I'm asking is that I would assume, especially North American clients, they're probably going to be paying in U.S. dollars. Right. They probably would want their loans right. in U.S. dollars mm-hmm. as opposed to Jamaican dollars. Right. Definitely. Right? Okay. Definitely. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's great. So all right. So we're on to the so, part of the mortgage. Right. Loans. So once you once you get that out of the way, where it comes down to getting your mortgage paperwork in order, then we start looking at the property. Right. So that's where the relationship really begins to take shape. Right. Because as I said, typically persons make one, two, or three real estate acquisitions for the duration of their life, right? So, of course, this means that most persons put a lot of thought into it, as mm-hmm. you should, right? So, as your realtor, um, Jamaica is so diverse. If you're living in Kingston, it's, you get a different experience from living in Portland, Different experience in Ocho Rios, different experience in Montego Bay, different experience in Negril, right? So part of the journey begins with having that discourse, that, that, that discourse, that dialogue to say what exactly is on your list, you know, must-haves, you know? Is it that you really want to be close to the coast, you know, which is not difficult to do in Jamaica because we are an island, Right. Um, is it that you want to be close to the airport? Do you want to start your vacation? You want to know that within an hour of landing, you're on vacation, you know? So that would definitely narrow down your options to like Montego Bay area or Kingston area where the international airports are. Um, what do you plan to do with the property? You know, is it something that's going to be um, y- your personal space or is this that investment? Property. What are the amenities that you're looking for? Are you looking for something that's catered, 24-hour security? Are you looking for something that's really remote because, with a lot of acreage because you have a green thumb that you want to explore, you want to do your own vegetable garden, you want to live off the land? You know, so that's where the whole relationship comes in. You know, that's where my importance now becomes evident because I understand where to point you, the direction to point you in order for you to satisfy those needs, right? So um, once we, we, we narrow down, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, I would typically say three or four options, and then we go on the road. Once you find something that ticks all your boxes or, or as much boxes as you, you're comfortable with, then we start the process of buying the property, right? Now that is where your attorney comes in. So a good attorney is key to ensuring that your best interests are protected. You know, your attorney does all the due diligence with the property they do, a title search to ensure that whoever is presenting this property as their own really has the right to sell it. You know, very important. So how do you go about finding a real estate attorney? All right. So I have made it easy for my clients by a process of attrition and elimination. You know, working with a number of real estate attorneys over the years and discarding the ones that didn't present um, good value for money for my clients. They weren't as responsive as they should be, or, you know, my clients just didn't feel like, hey, I'm safe or I'm satisfied with this service. And over the years, I've really narrowed it down to a small group that I can, they're very accessible. I mean, I can call them on a Sunday. I can call them on a public holiday. I can call them 10 o'clock in the night just to discuss maybe a, a pressing need of one of my clients, something that, that could possibly disrupt the deal. And I'm sure I know that they will find the time to discuss it so we can come up with a solution. So come tomorrow, I can call my client um, outside of Jamaica and say, hey, no, no problem, man. We got that taken care of. So 
if a client doesn't have a real estate attorney, but they're working with you, that kind of is part of the package that you're bringing to the table. Right. So, so I, I will refer that real estate attorney and say, hey, this is a person, right? And once I refer, because my group is so, has become so, so um, handpicked, then the relationship, they, my clients benefit from that relationship automatically by saying, hey, St. Tobin referred me, you know? So they know that, hey, listen, you got to stop what you're doing and attend to this client because it's easy to drop off my list. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, right. Yeah, you don't want to drop off my list, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's part of what I bring. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop with the attorney. Um, so once you're doing a mortgage, right, the first thing the bank is going to ask you for, two things. You're going to need to present what's called a surveyor's ID report, mm -hmm. right? So basically what that does, these are qualified um, professionals, technicians that go out to the property. Um, they pull a copy of the title to ensure that whatever conditions are laid out on the title was adhered to in the construction, right? So I um, mean, if it says this property based on the what you call the, the restrictive covenants on the title, if it says um, no more than two story allowed and they look at the house, it's a four story. They're the ones who are going to say, hey, hold up, you know, something went amiss right here, you know, because the bank will not lend you money for a property that has breached any of the restrictive covenants. So the bank will first need that before they go ahead. They, they need, they, those guys measure how far off from the road mm -hmm. the house is set back, how far from the boundaries. You know, that sort of thing. There are specific measurements that have to be adhered to because Jamaica has a very good building code, right? And all of this comes from the building code. So once you get that, then they will also, the bank will also require a valuation. Mm -hmm. You know, so for my North, for your North American um, viewers, uh, just to explain, a valuation is similar to what they would see as a home inspection, but it's still different. You know, it's still different. The things that the valuator looks for is different from what a home inspector looks for. You know, so the the the, the valuation typically looks at the makeup of the property, and to, to, to justify how much the seller is asking for it. You know, so it looks at the location, the surrounding areas, the neighborhood, the access to convenience, um, how close it is to the beach, to the highway, um, to infrastructure like electricity, water, cable, you know. Do they, look, do they look at comp sales? They look at comp sales okay. and they also look at what type of finish, what type of tiles is this? Um, terrazzo tile or is it marble tile mm -hmm. or is it porcelain tile they look at the, the the type of um roof you know because roof is a high value item right yeah they look at does it have a pool you know that automatically adds on maybe five million to the property right if it has a pool five million or more um they look at the the plumbing fixtures you know the electrical fixtures the the type of doors you know, the, the general design, is it a modern design? So you know? with the valuator, every property being bought or sold, you have to go through that process. No, you don't have to. Okay. So the valuator is, is, um, is a must when you're getting a mortgage. That's right. Okay. Right. So, so for, for a bank-funded purchase, the valuator is a must. Now, if you are spending your money, if this is a cash purchase, you don't need to do a valuation because you're buying the property based on your love for it. So you negotiate, and then once you once you you come to um, an agreement with the seller, then you pay them. You know, you, you do a valuation just to suit your own desires, but it's not a must. However, when it comes down to the survey, I would say whether it's a cash sale or a bank, always do a survey report on the property. Mm -hmm. You know, that's protection. Because you could buy this property cash, money, but 10 years down the road, 
you might need to borrow some money from the bank, maybe to launch a business or anything. And you say, okay, I've got this house. I can borrow some money off it. At that point, the bank will ask for a surveyor's ID report to ensure that, hey, what you're putting up to us is of value to us. They will, they will ask for a valuation and a surveyor's ID report. So the surveyor's ID report now becomes crucial because if that identifies some breach or encroachment that you had not taken the time to verify before you purchase it, then that plan goes up in smoke because the bank will not lend you any money on that title. Got it. Mm. Totally understood. All right. So is there anything else left in the process? Okay. So basically, um, it's a good idea to have to be fully prepared to what you're facing and from a financial perspective, right? So you don't have anything that's biting you in the dark or anything that's going to lead to any sleepless nights. So just to give a quick overview of what I call a cash outlay for a potential purchase, um, let's say you are purchasing a property that's 200000 US, right? And you are getting um, 95% from the bank. So that's, that's what we call the LTV, the loan-to-value ratio. So you're getting 95 from the bank, you will find 5%, which would be the gap, the 5% gap that takes it to the full figure of 100%. And, and that would also be typically your deposit, right? So in that case, um, your deposit would be 5% of 200,000, which would be $5,000, right? No, is it? 20? No, $10,000, $10,000. You will also need um, to factor in your legal fees. All right. So in Jamaica, legal fees are a percentage of the cost of the property that you're purchasing. Um, a range it ranges from about one to five percent. Most attorneys will automatically charge you three percent. Now there are also instances when it goes less than that, depending on the the overall price of the property and who your your realtor is, you know, because for the for the attorneys I deal with, once I refer a client to them, they get what I call the family price, which we can discuss um, on a more personal level. Um, so you will need also to pay for the sales agreement, which is a different cost. The sales agreement is the platform that is the foundation then that the whole transaction is built in. It's a legal document that tries to cover all aspects of the transaction. It is what goes to the tax office. It is what goes to um, the, the, the land agency, all of that. Very important. So that is about $50,000 per person. So both sides of the transaction, the purchaser and the vendor, which is the seller, pay for that sales agreement. So it's split in two. So it's typically 100,000 Jamaican and it's split in two where the purchaser pays half, the vendor pays half. Um, when it comes on to transfer fee, which is 2%, it used to be um, 5%, which is split in two, was split in two um, by the purchaser and the vendor. About three years ago, um, the government made some very positive changes that I think had a positive impact on the amount of transactions that started to flow through the system where they not only reduced the transfer tax to 2% instead of 5%, but they also relieved the purchaser from paying transfer tax. So that 2% is borne fully by the seller. Right, so not only did it go less, but it also took some burden off the purchaser, and you will understand that that it, that in itself is a bigger incentive for a purchaser to jump into the market. Um, so that's the transfer tax, which is just for the seller. Then there is what's called a registration fee. Now that's a government tax as well, and it's 0 0.50 percent of the cost of the, the property, and this also is split in two. 
Um, the purchaser pays 0.25%. The seller, which is a vendor, pays 0.25%. And then there is a, a stamp duty, which is a nominal amount, 5,000 Jamaican, right? It's also it's split into the purchaser pays half, the vendor pays half. And then the purchaser will have some other miscellaneous costs, which are minimal as well. Uh, work out to less than 200 US dollars, uh, which those are for legal letters that the lawyer will write on your behalf. For example, um, to transfer the water, the utility to your name, um, the, the, your attorney will write that letter for you to take to the utility company, and that's a cost of maybe $5,000. Also, the possession... Jamaican. Jamaican, mm -hmm. Jamaican, yeah. The possession letter, which shows that you now legally own that property even before you get the title in your hand. That's also a legal document that um, the attorney will charge for. I put all of those in, in a miscellaneous group. And as I said, in total, it comes to less than $200 US. Okay. So, and that's basically it. Once you have gone through that process, congratulations. <laughs> you know, right. you now are a proud owner of real estate in paradise. And typically, what is a timeline looking like, especially, specifically, if you're going through a banking institution for the financing? All right. So, yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm, I'm being quite honest. That is the point of frustration for most transactions. And I really hope um, the powers that be, the legislation, will quickly move to kind of, to, to, to make the, 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 the process less cluttered, less confusion, confusing, and move faster. Because um, a, a, a mortgage sale is typically, typically now taking like six months. You know, which in the time, in, in, in the, 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 the reality that we're living now, six months is a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very long time. We need people who have now gotten used to instant gratification, speeded up their time, sped up their timelines. A lot of countries now still put the consumer, the purchaser, in a position where they can compare and say, hey, if I'm in the US, if I'm buying something down in Miami or South Beach, it can close in 30 days. Why would I wait six months? But in I think, Jamaica. and not that I'm condoning or agreeing right. with this timeline, but mm -hmm. I think it's important to be realistic and let people know that's right. what it is. I think that's, that's the most important that's thing. Right. And that's I always think with situations like this, and I think about the many, many landowners that we know that mm -hmm. you've done business with, right. hoteliers, business owners, etc. And they own these beautiful properties, these apartments. And I always think, like, if they can do it, so can I. And exactly. if there's a will, there's a way. But I think setting that realistic expectation from day one. That's right. If you know you're coming into That's this, right. like, this is going to be a six-month journey. That's right. That's right. And I think and, people will understand. And I find that works. Yes. Because I always try to, what I call, manage my client's expectations. You right. know? Because... I am very cognizant of the fact that you're coming from a locale that you know that, hey, where I am, this takes 30 days. So I have to grab, be aware of that so I can identify it and address it. And, of course, you start to plan your schedule around that, you know? Right. right. And, and um, for a cash sale, um, I think three, three, three months is a realistic time, time frame gotcha. for a cash sale all things being equal. Right. You know, because there's a saying in Jamaica that says there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. So what that typically means is that there can be um, hidden hidden information that doesn't come to light until after the sale starts that could impact, uh, you know, your expectations and the timelines. Mm -hmm. But all things being equal with a clean title, Three months is a realistic expectation for a cash sale. No, fair enough. Yeah. Mm. And now I do want to get into Negril yes. a little bit, especially since we're here in Negril. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so, and we've talked about this the last few months mm -hmm. in that you, as a realtor, and also the company that you're working for, Remax, have mm -hmm. plans to make 
more of an impact or have more an impact on in the Negro community. Right. And to open that discussion up, why now the interest in Negro and what is attracting Remax to have more of a foot stamp here? All right. So let me tackle it first from a personal perspective. As I said, I have, I have had the opportunity as an individual to explore. You know, working with, with the airline gave me that opportunity because most persons would understand as airline employees, free travel is one of the benefits that you, you, you really, you really um, love, you enjoy. So I did make use of that opportunity to discover the world, right? Very exciting times, very interesting trips I've taken. But I still find Jamaica to be the best place in the world mm -hmm. for me. You know, this is my spot. But even within Jamaica, Negril is, is my happy place. You know, Negril is where I, I recharge, is where I just feel carefree, you know. And I think it's the energy that created Negril from back in the maybe the 70s or so when it was seen as more of like a, a bohemian paradise you know um free-minded persons creatives and persons who just wanted a break from the stress that they found negril to be like their place mm -hmm. you know over the years negril has changed a lot and you know it has evolved it has morphed into different different stages but i think negril has still managed to somehow maintain that energy where people still can find that tranquility that they so desire and me personally i find it you know every time i come to negril so that's me i really love negril now from a business perspective and from an investment perspective from from a real estate perspective um there is so much opportunity in Negril, you know, and it it will come down to reshaping the narrative and how people think, because typically Negril was and is still seen as a short term stay destination, where people come, stay in a hotel for a week or two, and then leave, right? But I, I, I go back to what I alluded to earlier about persons now pushing the boundaries of the whole work from home concept and operating on a global scale and realizing that Negril, the location has not changed. And in real estate, it's three things. Anybody will tell you it's location, location, location. And Negril... Um, excels when it comes down to location uh, when we talk about the typical offerings that um, somebody in and outside of a Jamaica will require from their vacation spot sea sand and sun there's no shortage of that in Negril so that translates into buyer interest you know now Remax and myself we have we have I, I mean as me as a part of Remax we understand that as realtors, we have to take charge of that process. You know, we have to understand that um, with the market being there, if the typical person who is interested in Negril and has become used to Negril being just a short-term stay, unless we point that it out to them that Negril can be more than that, they will continue to see Negril as a short-term stay. Um, so that is part of us deciding to to um, invest in in um, improving our presence in Negril. And um, let me ask you: Are you trying to change that narrative as a company? In terms of what? Moving Negril, as far as how it's perceived, from being a short-term stay location oh, to certainly. Be a long-term. Certainly, stay. certainly. So that is the overall plan, and there are factors that are helping to helping us as a whole, even you included as a as a contributor to the awareness of what's happening in the Negril space. Um, factors that are now being enforced, being enacted through legislation. Um, for example, the whole concept of Negril as a space 
is being expanded, right? Because one of the things that makes Negro special is that it's not cluttered. You know, people f- don't feel like they are in a m- metropolis. You know, people feel like they are in a real, what they see in the movies as an island paradise, Negro is what embodies that, right? From my perspective, the, the coastline of Negro is defined, right? I mean, the, 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 the establishments, the hotels, the bed and breakfast and whatever, they already have made an indelible mark in the landscape and the character of Negrel. So not, m- and that is a good thing. And you know, it, it, it embodies everything that Negrel is supposed to be. There's a lot of flora and fauna. There's not a lot of concrete. And that's not going to change. I mean, the environmental protectors, and we thank them very much, have put the, the, the legislat- legislation in place to ensure that Negrel remains a habitat for wildlife, for certain um, species of birds, um, insects, that sort of thing that might not be possible anywhere else, right? And what they are also doing, as I alluded to, is kind of um, widening the physical description of Negril, you know? So more development can happen. Can you talk specifically about that? I, I know what you're talking right. about, but if you can just elaborate on that a little bit for the uh, audience. All right, good. Um, without getting into too much specifics, without having the diagram in hand, mm-hmm. I mean, Negril is going to be expanded more eastward towards Lucy. So what that will, uh, will bring is more... Um, resort developments coming into that space. Um, it's going to, of course, provide more jobs. It's going to provide the opportunity for more industries, more commercial activity, more more traffic. And as we talk about the traffic aspect, um, the plans are also in place to fix some of the nightmares that anybody who comes to Negril on any sort of basis, regular or not, will have a little uneasiness about what might happen going through Lucy or going through Hopewell. I myself have experienced that many times. You know, I've been stuck in traffic. I mean, if there's a heavy shower of rain in Lucy. So all of those things have been taken into consideration. The necessary adjustments to the traffic flow that is already um, tabled and just for it to actually go into place. And what that also means for the savvy investor out there, right? Any time to invest in, in real estate is always five years ago. We know that, all right? But what we can use this as looking at the trends, because my opinion about Jamaica on a whole is that we are still in the developmental stages of the real estate journey for Jamaica, very much so, right? Negril or this end of Jamaica is still at the starting block. So for the person who wants to be the one five or ten years down the line telling the glory story of that investment that they made and how much it's paying off for them, now is the time in Negril. Now is the time because all the signs are pointing to Negril, this section of Jamaica, booming. You know, everything. I mean, even as a, real, as a realtor, there are at least two developments, two or three developments that I know are in the plans now that are going to just be, you know, awesome. Awesome developments. And these are things that once all of these changes and infrastructure were come into place, you won't be able to buy it. You know, now is the time. I mean, the person who knows Negro from infancy will know that on even on the normal Manly Boulevard, the, which we call the Beach Road, those lands were basically being given away. You know? And now, if you're not talking about a million or 1.5 million US per acre in Jamaica, don't even sit at the table. In, sorry, in U.S. dollars, in Negril, 1.5, 1 or $1.5 million U.S. per acre. You know? Don't even, don't even approach the table because, and that's if you can get it. You know? 
because they stop making land. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah. so right now, for the person who is savvy and who wants to be ahead of the curve, this is ground zero for Negro. You know, that's my humble opinion. And the two developments that you alluded to before, mm. are those residential developments or commercial? Residential. Okay. Residential developments. So once we have the residential developments, um, the, 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 the people present who are now consumers, that's what's going to drive the commercial. Because now you're going to have to ensure that hardware stores are nearby, supermarkets. You know, and I realize that even Negril, just pay attention to what's going on. You know, Negril typically is seen also as not a long-term residence town because maybe more than 75% of the people who work in the hotels in Negril, they don't live in Negril. You know, they, are, they live in Lucy, they live in Green Island, they live in Little London, Savlamar, and whatever. So because of that, a lot of the infrastructure that supports urbanization and supports um, population growth, st- Negro is still lagging behind where that is concerned. A good hospital, now we are there now, right? There's a, a, a first world medical center that just opened, right? Did it open already? Didn't open yet. Right, all right. So um, it's, it's there. I mean, the building is there. So we know where it's going. I mean, the supermarket, which a lot of developers might overlook, the fact that when somebody buys into a location, they have to eat. Right? So, and they like to find familiar food and grocery items that typically they won't find at a corner shop. You know, if you're used to a certain type of cooking oil or a certain type of cereal or a certain cut of steak or certain fruits like pear, you know, and I'm not talking about avocado or what we in Jamaica, what we call pear, like a pear, the, you know, that you can, can eat as a fruit, like how we eat apple. Those sort of things are typically not available at a corner store. So when you see a supermarket now, um, modern design with those type of um, access to those things, what it does, it shows you that this is now catering to the population because typically the North American tourists who comes to Negril those things, they get it in the hotel. They're in an all-inclusive hotel. So they, are, they don't even realize that if I buy in Jamaica, if I buy property, I, I need to know that I can get access to my creature comforts, the things that, my comfort food, that sort of thing. So when I look and I see these things appearing on the landscape in Negril, it shows me that, hey, this is where we're going. We're heading there. And it's a bit, I mean, and I, I really like what you're saying mm-hmm. about Negril and getting a little bit more understanding right. of seeing where the hockey puck is right. going and not necessarily where it is right now mm-hmm. and anticipating and preparing for that. Right. And I look at Negril kind of answering that question between the commercial and residential right. as a chicken or the egg situation. Right. And you kind of explain to me and, and your opinion that it's the residential that's going to drive the commercial. That's right. Feel. That's right. And I, I do agree with that, you know, mm-hmm. because you need the people to drive the economy. Mm-hmm. And if the people, and when I say the people, I mean people who are going to be living long-term, stay here, mm-hmm. if they don't have viable accommodations to a standard that they're used to living, right, then right. it's going to be hard to push that. Hence right. why I am, I, I'm pushing for Negril so hard right. in our, our own way here because, as you stated earlier, that Negril was made up for tourists right. and tourist accommodation and short-term accommodation. Right. And now, as a community, and you can feel it, we're moving into a phase where we're now looking to attract long-term people. Right. And, but we need the accommodation to That's do that right. first. So at this time with Negril, are you focusing on, on any particular area of the town? whether it's West End or the beach or the wider Negril? Uh, so I would say the wider Negril. Okay. Because for, 
for anybody. First of all, for any. Person. I'm sorry, and I just want to be clear when I mean the wider the grill for the audience is that outside of what we call the traditional. Okay, Israel, okay, right? okay. All right, cool. So let 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 me take it first on the molecular level, where for pers- Negro is a community, right? It's a as I said, it's a feeling, it's a vibe, it's an energy, um, it's a fan club, right? Because if you go on like the the social media Negro boards. You have like a friendly rivalry, and some of the boards are be- between people who they are dedicated to the beach road, and some who they are hardcore cliff. You know, L- nothing to them but the cliff. So we are tr- trying now to focus on the hybrid, right? First of all, something that will appeal to everybody. You'll never get. 100% everybody, but once you get enough persons interested to move the units, move numbers, you know, to buy into the thing, you're on the right, you're on the right track, you know, and um, one, of, one of the challenges, you know, one of the hurdles that we will have to deal with, and we're 50% there already, because once you identify it, you know that hey, we have to put strategies to deal with it. Is that the 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 build up of the the breakdown of who comes to Negril, as we said before, is short term visitors who might not necessarily have come to Negril with the thought of buying a piece of Negril or buying a piece of Jamaica. Not that they wouldn't, they just were not traditionally in that mind frame. But what I've been discovering with my conversations with the the professionals in the transportation sector, the Juta guys and the Jekyll guys, the ones who transport the tourists from the airport back to the airport and to the to the attractions in Jamaica, there's all there's always been interest. It's just now to educate the the the, the um the participants in that whole process as to how this is done, you know? But I'll also say to that is that I was speaking with a gentleman yesterday and he lives in Canada and he recently bought a, bought a property on the beach. Mm-hmm. And he would, we were talking about the inventory or type of inventory that was available for purchase in the grill. Mm-hmm. And... He found that, and we're beating a dead horse here, and I know that, but he found that the inventory that was available, everything was just dated, you know, for the most part. Mm -hmm. And he ended up buying a property uh, for, he's probably going to watch this, and he's like, oh, why are you telling my business? But (laughs) anyway, he bought the property for uh, 200,000 US, and Mm. he was... I guess a little surprised at how much work that he has to put into it. Right. And I think that there are... Sorry. Excuse Excuse me. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that there are... Make sure you leave that in. Don't cut that sneeze out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We're trying to keep it authentic here. Yeah. I think that there are people, like you said, that are taking these rides with Judah and J-Cal. Right. That one, like you're correct, they do need that education on right. that it's possible and how to do it. But then when they come to the process and prospect of of, of, of purchasing the real mm-hmm. estate and they're starting to discover like, man, there's not a lot here. Um, right. There's not a lot that satisfy what right. I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And that was just kind of a timely example right. of him kind of being disappointed. But I, I reassured him, though. Just like you said, that Negril is at ground zero. Right. And this is the best time to invest. Right. And I told him, I was like, yeah, you're going through it now. It's not the best property. It's a dated property. And you're refurbishing it and putting this money into it. But mm-hmm. you're not going to regret it in five years from now. Right. And uh, I say that all to say, it's just like, and I continue to push this, like, we need more housing development and we right. need modern housing development. That's and right. I think you were alluding to two developments that were happening. Right. But for those folks that are out there, it's just a great time and a great opportunity, in my opinion, right. to, to, to come and invest in the grow. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And do you feel that way as well in terms of where things are heading? 
Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, the 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 indicators are pointing up, positive. You know, positive. I mean, and what you just pointed about about the inventory being a little bit dated. Yes, and with with new builds coming on, that's going to put that that adrenaline shot mm -hmm. that really the landscape in Negril needs to let people realize that hey, yes, we can own something in Negril. And it's going to be modern. It's going to be close to the beach. It's going to have all the, the bells and whistles that we're used to. So we're living in Negril, in the Negril space, um, being a part of the community and still feeling comfortable, you know, having access to conveniences, right. having access to the things that we're used to. As I said, the supermarket will have the type of bagel that you, you right. know, you, you, you love the type of ice cream, you know, that sort of things. The fruits that you get, it's going to be better. Because so, everything in Jamaica, when it comes down to natural produce, is naturally going to be of right. a higher standard. That's a given. Last mm -hmm. question on Negril. Mm -hmm. If somebody were thinking about coming into Negril and maybe doing a small development, residential development, say 10 to 20 units, right? Mm -hmm. 10 to 20 units. Where do you think the ideal location for something like that would be? A mixture of one, two, and one to two bedrooms and studio apartments. All right. Or where would you do it if you, the, if you were going to do there, that? There's a lot of options, mm -hmm. a lot of options. And as I said, there is enough on both sides of the divide between who thinks the beach road is the best location as opposed to who think the Clips is the best location. And there's real estate on both sides. You know, uh, arguably, I think there would be more um, acreage in the West End because the, the beach is, I mean, the beach, that's, it's, it's full. I mean, it, it's not easy to find um, property that's right on the beach, you know, on that side of the road. But on the opposite side, um, where the morass is, there are still spots there that are ready. And you just walk across and you're at the beach. It's just to, to, to temper the, the consumer's expectations that, hey, you are across the road from the beach. You know, there are some persons who want to be able to step out right on the beach so that might not be for them but there's enough persons in the conversation to to know that it will sell gotcha. i mean and if you're on the west end it's the same thing you might not find something on the cliff side but right across the road and with the the changes in the building um, regulations for negril now it is going to allow for buildings to go up a little bit higher than typically they were allowed to. Up to what? So, um, I think it goes up to about four stories now, mm -hmm. four stories high with the new regulations. So persons will still be able to get a, a fulsome view of the ocean when they build, you know? And the land is there. Right. It is definitely there. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. I know people yeah. will appreciate that. Yeah, man. And the last topic that I want to talk about is Throp X. Right. And this is something- And I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for everybody out there, St. Alban is going to be one of the panelists that we're going to be having there. And as, a, as you've heard, he's very knowledgeable about real estate in Jamaica and the processes and also very knowledgeable about real estate here in the West. Hence why I had to get him as one of the panelists. Yeah, this to, is to my, Nigel is my, is my chill spot. It's my happy place. It's my... You know, yes. yeah. So I'm excited to have you to be a part of that. And, you know, we've had a lot of great conversations about the conference, what it's going to be, and also like future conferences right. as well. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that you're, you're going to be a part of it. Remax is going to be a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. And really, I'm looking at it as we're both trying to help grow Negril and grow Jamaica. And right. I want to continue to work with people who are of that, that mindset. And that's why I'm proud to be working with you on, on this project and for you to be a part of it. Right. And I'm, I'm happy to be uh, on board. I'm happy to be on board. And um, I mean, I just want all your viewers to know that, I mean, whatever resources I have, whatever information I have, whatever guidance I can give, hey, just reach out to me. 
and I'm your guy. And so with that, can you give us the best way for people to get in contact with you? And also, if you have any social media, let us know what those are as well. All right, thank you. So my cell phone, um, which is my primary means of contact, it's 876-550-1215. And that is also on WhatsApp. Um, if you prefer email, it is sclark at remax dash elite dot com dot jm or a simpler email might be sent Aubin clark one at gmail dot com that is the sent is not spelled out it's st so it's s t a u b y n c l a r k e one that's the number one at gmail dot com all right and um social media Island style real estate. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, man, for your time today. Mm -hmm.